should I start? Should I start? Okay. Um, okay, so um, this is a talk about um, constraint satisfaction problems and how to solve them in certain cases. So for example, one kind of problem I'm interested in is like queue coloring, where the input is a graph and a set of queue colors, and the goal is to uh, find a vertex coloring so that no uh, two adjacent vertices receive the same color. So this is a constraint satisfaction problem in the sense that you have variables for, each, uh, for the vertices and uh, constraints for the edges, okay? So um, in this talk, I'm not gonna talk about approximation algorithms. Instead, I'll focus on identifying interesting families of constraint satisfaction problems for that admit a solution and we can find such a solution um, you know, efficiently. And how are we going to do that? Well, uh, we are going to uh, approach this task by using a stochastic local search algorithm. So what is this? So it's an algorithm that, for example, in the case of queue coloring, it starts at an arbitrary configuration, like this one, and then while violated constraints exist, so like this, um, it focuses on, on one constraint, say this one, and takes a random action in an effort to fix it. So for example, it could you know, choose new random variable, uh, new random values for, for, its, uh, for the variables of the constraint, like this. And what we would like to do is understand when this type of procedures actually work, provably, and then use them, use this understanding to identify interesting families of constraint satisfaction problems that are in fact uh, you know, tractable. And a priori, this is not an easy task because you know, when uh, you fix a constraint, you might violate another constraint and this uh, you know, could keep going. So um, towards this uh, goal of understanding these processes, there has been a breakthrough um, uh, the past decade roughly due to Mozart and Tardos who showed that a very simple process like this can actually um, make constructive a very powerful and very deep uh, statement in probabilistic combinatorics, which is called the Lovas local lemma. And this statement says, in a simplified form, uh, it says the following. So imagine that you have an input constraint satisfaction problem that you want to prove that is uh, satisfiable, it has a solution. So then what you do is you introduce a probability distribution over the configuration space, okay? So for example, if your input, uh, if input CSP was a case in your formula, you would introduce, say, the um, uniform measure over the binary cube. And then the following happens. So if under this probability distribution, each constraint is not very likely, right? And the input is sparse enough, so uh, say the, um, each constraint does not share variables with uh, more than other uh, delta over constraints, and p times delta is less than over uh, e, then um, uh, you know that um, uh, there exists a solution. Basically, you know that if you sample from a mu, your, uh, by the way, this should be a product distribution in this case over the variables. If you sample from mu, then there exists a positive, although very small probability that you will satisfy every constraint, okay? And uh, so this is what the local lemma says, and this is um, an existential statement in that um, in the original proof, this probability of avoiding the violation of every constraint could be exponentially small uh, in the size of the input. And the beauty and the elegance of the um, Mosler Tardos algorithm is that they use a simple uh, stochastic local search procedure to actually uh, retrieve solutions whenever such co uh, this condition is, um, retrieve efficiently solutions where, whenever this condition is true. Okay. And naturally, you know, after such a breakthrough, there have been uh, a lot of a lot of results and a lot of work that has been trying to, you know, generalize and extend uh, their techniques in different uh, settings and algorithms. So for example, what if the, um, uh, the, the distribution mu that you use is not product? Or what if you want to analyze an ent entirely different algorithm? And I guess what I want to talk to you, to, to you about today is a realization that um, we came up with, which is the following. Um, roughly, all of this type of analysis 
that are inspired by the LLL, by the Mother and Dardos algorithm, they can be seen as a way, one way to see them, is a specific technique for bounding the spectral radius of a matrix that has to do with the algorithm that we're trying to analyze. And uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. So this is contribution number one. Contribution number two is, now that we have this new viewpoint, now that we understand that this is what's going on, we can extend uh, the techniques and come up with a new algorithmic allowed condition that can afford to analyze quite sophisticated local search algorithms that we could not analyze before. And we do that by um, quantifying what we call point to set correlations. Uh, and this is something that has, hasn't uh, been done before. And uh, I'll explain also what this is, okay? And then we give concrete applications of this theorem to, to problems. Okay, so um, in order for me to explain this idea about the spectral radius and the matrix, I'll focus on the simplest example possible, which is basically how the Mosler-Tardos algorithm applies to, um, to KCNA formulas, okay? So if, basically, if you apply the local lemma with the uniform distribution, when your input is a KCNA formula, then you get the following statement, that if your formula shares variables with at most two to the k over e other clauses, sorry, if your formula has the property that each clause shares variables with at most two to the k over e other clauses, then a solution exists, and this, follow, and this algorithm, this mozart tardos algorithm, basically finds a solution. So what is the algorithm? Uh, it starts from an arbitrary assignment, and then while valid clauses exist, it focuses on such a clause, and let's say the lowest index one for the purposes of this talk, and um, resample its variables uniform and random, and it keeps doing that until hopefully and you know, provably it will find a solution after a polynomial time. Okay, so um, let's see how we would analyze this process you know, through the lens of this kind of uh, framework. So, uh, so this is a Markov chain, right? So since it's a Markov chain, it has a transition matrix which we write down uh, as follows. So uh, submatrix A here is basically the submatrix of the transition matrix that governs the transitions between the violating part of the state space. Okay, so this, this submatrix governs the transitions between violating configurations of the binary cube. Okay? Now we have B here that governs the transitions between violating states, so satisfying ones, and a priori this could be empty, we don't know that. And you have I here at the identity because once you reach a satisfying assignment, you stay there and you look. And we have uh, the zero matrix uh, there because once you reach a satisfying assignment, you know where to go back, okay? So now why is this view of the transition matrix useful? Well, it's because if you want to bound what is the probability that the algorithm has not reached a satisfying assignment in T steps, in an execution of T steps, then basically you just have to focus on A because all these transitions will be violating transitions, right? So you just focus on the tth power of A. And even more specifically, if you want to prove that the algorithm terminates, if it starts from any arbitrary satisfying assignment, this is equivalent to saying that the spectral radius of A is less than one, right? So this is, uh, if you want to show that no matter where you start from, you will converge. This is the equivalent state, okay? So, um, and the, all this LLL analysis is a specific technique. It can be seen as a specific technique for establishing this fact, okay? So the first step is that instead of bounding uh, the spectral radius, we will, we will bound the norm, one norm of, uh, of A. So in particular, the one norm. I will explain uh, why is that. Possibly after a change of basis. And, and this is because uh, change of basis retains the spectral radius and the one norm upper bound. So any operator norm upper bound the spectral radius, okay? So this is the first step. And in the case of KSAT, things will be sim simple. We don't need a change of basis. It will be the identity. Okay. Now, the second step, right, is to, to do a row decomposition of A into a sum of matrices. So basically, um, we will have one matrix for each class, so for each constraint. And this is a row decomposition in the sense that this matrix AI for class CI 
it only retains the rows for which CI is the lowest index violated class in the current state. So each row corresponds to a state, and we, for matrix AI, we retain only these rows for which the algorithm will actually pick this clause to uh, the sample at this time, okay? And uh, clearly, you know, the sum of matrices AI uh, sums to A. And the idea now is that we would use nor uh, bounds on the norms of these individual matrices along with the sparsity of the input to get, um, to get a, a bound on the norm of the sum, okay? And uh, let me explain why we're using a one norm. Well, it turns out the one norm in this case is equal to one over two to, uh, is at most one over two to the K, which notice, that, by the way, that this is the probability that a clause is violated when you sample from the uniform distribution. And this is no accident because in this setting, the one norm has a following combinatorial interpretation. So basically, it's a measure between the, dis the, between the distance of two distributions. One distribution is the distribution induced by the actions of the algorithm, right? When we address a clause in a random state, so this is one distribution. The other distribution is the uniform distribution over the configuration space, over the binary space. So the one or can be interpreted as a measure between the distance of, the dis of these distributions and when things, when these distributions coincide, then what you get exactly is the probability, uh, then the, the one or evaluates the probability of the clause being violated under the uniform distribution. Okay, so this is why we got one over two to the K um, uh, bound for the one norm in the case of case. Okay, and in general, you know, if you want to use other measures, other probability measures of the configuration space, you basically do a change of basis with a matrix that is induced by the measure you want to use and something similar holds, okay? The, the one norm captures uh, basically, again, a distance between two distributions. Okay, so this is uh, kind of uh, the interpretation for the one norm. So now let's get back to the idea. So we have basically a sum of matrices and we know a bound on the one norm of uh, each of the summons, and we now want to get a, a bound on the norm of the whole thing, okay? So the way we do this is we will focus on the, on, on the, on tip, on the tith power of, of our sum, and we basically, you know, we will just expand the sum, right? So this is where sparsity will come into play. So, but right now I'm not doing anything fancy, I'm just expanding the sum, right? And I'm only, so I get a sum product, and I'm only uh, keeping uh, the sequences that survive. So, so, so basically, the products of matrices that have a non-zero evaluation. So I haven't done nothing fancy, right? Now, sparsity comes into play in all this uh, type of algorithms because basically, what you want to bound now is, you know, uh, how the, uh, the size of sequences that survive grows, this is what you want to bound. And now sparsity comes into play because it turns out uh, that via a standard by now counting argument that uh, I will not uh, show you now, the fact that whenever you resample a class, the, the, the sparsity assumption impl implies that you can violate at most delta other clauses. So you can use this fact to bound basically uh, this set of surviving sequences and show that it grows at a rate, you know, at most E times delta to the power of T instead of a trivial bound which would be M, the number of clauses to the power of T, okay? So sparsity comes to play uh, like this and now you basically have all the ingredients to uh, conclude the proof. So basically if your uh, uh, input is sparse enough, then you can bound the size of surviving sequences. Its surviving sequence uh, is assigned, you know, um, the product of the corresponding norms is at most two to the k minus t. So when you combine everything, uh, you show that basically as t grows, the norm goes to zero. So it had to be that the spectral radius of the, uh, of the of matrix A is less than one, okay? So this is kind of roughly the idea behind all these proofs, okay, so this is 
how you can see uh, um, proofs in this area. And once we realized that, we said, okay, what if, what if now we try to be more refined? What if we try to decompose A, uh, not into a sum where you have one constraint, sorry, one matrix for each constraint, but what we do if we had one matrix for each constraint and set of constraints that it could possibly violate, okay? And the idea is that the norms, bounding the norms of these matrices now is a more refined and detailed way to understand the difference between the distribution induced by the actions of the algorithm and the target probability distribution new, in this case, the, the uniform distribution. So now we focus on uh, you know, this point of such correlations and we are able to be more refined and um, you know, um, uh, analyze more uh, uh, you know, complicated algorithms. And we get a theorem like this. It's not important to, uh, to parse it right now. What is important is that uh, all of the, you know, all the, you know, many of the past uh, works in this area that, are, um, that I show here, what they basically did in, the, in hindsight is uh, they try to bound the norm of these matrices that correspond to constraints under assumptions. And what we say is, first of all, you don't need any assumptions as, as long as you, you can bound the norm. That's all you need. And second of all, you don't need to look at this a specific uh, matrix, one, one uh, matrix per constraint, but you can look at this more refined matrices, basically. So this is kind of a takeaway message here. And as an application, what we showed is that um, you can um, generalize basically two results of uh, Molloy and uh, Alon, uh, Krivelevich and Sudakov, and get, so one of our applications is the following, that says that uh, it's for the problem of Hue coloring, and it says that when the input is a graph with maximum degree delta, and you have the promise that each vertex is contained uh, in at most T triangles, then uh, the chromatic number is bounded by this expression. And um, this is uh, a nice one. Uh, this, is a, this is a good expression in the following sense. If you apply it to uh, GNP uh, random graphs, where P uh, is basically uh, small enough, it's sparse enough, then it matches um, with what is known as um, uh, the algorithmic barrier for random graphs. Um, it's okay if you don't know what this is. It's basically um, uh, uh, a bound on the density of random graphs up to which our algorithms work so far. And one way to interpret this result is that, that for sparse enough, locally sparse enough graphs, you can get all the way to this threshold without using any other property of the random graph. So what you really want is the pseudorandom property that is locally sparse. And this, what is, uh, that determines the tractability of random graphs you know, in this uh, sparse regimes. And by the way, if you could improve this result uh, in this sparse regime, when uh, T is basically sublinear in delta, then, um, then you could have shown a ba basically a major breakthrough uh, in random graph theory. And many people think that this is uh, unexpected. Okay? So um, uh, as future work, I would like, you know, one of the things I would like to do is the following. So what I've shown you here, at the end of the day, it has an interpretation for, um, uh, you know, local search algorithms, but I've, at the end of the day is a statement, it's a linear algebraic statement for how you can bound um, uh, spectral radius of, or norms of matrices when you know that they can be decomposed into a sum of sparse matrices, okay? So uh, what I would like to do is basically use these ideas presented uh, in this paper in applications to, you know, beyond combinatorics, for example, uh, you know, control theory or, um, you know, stuff like that. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's a lot.